Hello and welcome to Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. I'm Swastika and today is day six of the war in Ukraine as Russian troops continue their advance. On the ground, the cities of Kiev, Kharkov and Mariupol continue to be vital. Media reports say that a huge convoy of Russian forces is in the vicinity of Kiev. Meanwhile, hundreds of thousands of refugees have fled to the neighboring countries. Talks were held between the Russian and Ukrainian delegations in Belarus yesterday and the representatives returned to their respective capitals for further consultations. Meanwhile, punitive action on Russia has been increasing from various sectors in the West. The most substantial impact will be felt through the wide-ranging financial sanctions imposed by the US and European countries. However, the impact will not just be felt by the people of Russia, but by those across the world. Now, to understand this better and open it out further, let's go over to Prabir Perkayastha. Prabir, we have in fact spoken about this in our show even yesterday. Now, a key announcement that the central, uh, the Russian Central Bank, its assets have been frozen. Now, how does this uh, play out for Russia? What are the options available to Russia? And also, what are these reserves? Well, the frozen uh, assets, as you were saying, are frozen with the European banks or with the United States, what is called the Fed, who are the central, which is the central bank of the United States. The central bank of these two, shall we say, not countries, because European Union is a bloc, well, the US is a country, they, they seem to have frozen Russian foreign exchange reserves, which are with them. Now, Russia has reduced its foreign exchange reserves with the Fed, so they don't hold too much of dollar reserves. Mm. They don't hold it in the United States. So therefore, the step that the European Union has taken is important. How much they have frozen in terms of uh, Russian uh, foreign exchange in the, in the European Union, in the Central Bank of European Union, is open to question at the moment. We don't know the amount. But it could be anything between 300 to 350 billion uh, dollars equivalent of uh, foreign exchange reserves, maybe even 400 uh, billion foreign exchange reserves have been seized or frozen, as we said, that it's really frozen, not seized, yeah. by the European Union. So what does it, how does it affect Russia? One of it is that it cannot use this foreign exchange reserves to pay for imports or to settle a, any other uh, transactions it takes outside European, outside uh, Russia, particularly with the European Union. So though the money is there, it's allegedly not seized, but it can't be used immediately by Russia. That's one issue. So what happens, as you talked about, is how, for instance, does Russia then pay for whatever it needs to do? So that is well, it can go to a barter system. It could use uh, other currencies, okay. renminbi, for instance, Chinese uh, currency, or any other currency where the whole reserves and where it has not been frozen, frozen. by that country, mm -hmm. the country which controls that currency. So that's one possibility. The second is that as Russian currency seems to be falling in the international market, they cannot shore up the value of the uh, of the ruble in external uh, markets. So essentially, people are not trading in the ruble in, say, European Union or in the US because there is no way to transact that currency uh, transaction. Yeah. So that is the second part. That therefore you have we have what is called the free fall of the ruble, but it's a notional fall because you can't buy or sell it at the moment, yes. not in those places. So therefore, the so-called free fall is a notional fall. One shouldn't take that seriously. The question is that how does then what you have raised? How does a Russia uh, transact business, either buying or selling goods? Hmm. So, as far as the Russia is concerned they have a relatively strong uh, internal economy in which they don't really import stuff which they have no other source of imports. In fact, it re it's a primary producer. It produces both oil and gas. It produces wheat, a lot of wheat which it exports. It's a net exporter for a range of commodities. And if on the international market, it also does export certain metals, which again others require. But Russia in that sense is perhaps less dependent for all of these 
uh, on the external market, but it is dependent on a lot of finished goods that it needs, including electronic chips and for other equipment and so on, which then it has to ex get from the Chinese market. The question is really, how does it shore up its currency? And there the answer is very simple. Mm. It can do what India used to do once upon a time, which Soviet Union used to do, say that my currency is not exchangeable, that we don't consider, it's not a convertible currency. We issue exchange controls. You cannot take money out of Russia. You cannot bring in money out of uh, into Russia with an exchange rate which will be decided by either in, uh, in Germany or in the US. It will be decided by us. It's a fixed rate. So this is what the exchange rate can be considered. It's not a convertible currency anymore, which the ruble was till now. It's not a convertible currency. So exchange controls of the old-fashioned kind can be again imposed over here. If it is, it still leaves the question out what happens to the frozen uh, reserves mm. that it holds in the banks. That's a question for the future. But right now, is there something they can do? Yes, they probably can do this. And of course, they can trade with countries like China, where these ex this kind of uh, controls, this kind of sanctions do not exist. Mm. Does it hamper Russia? Yes. The big question is, how will European Union, particularly Germany, pay for its gas? And how will United States pay for the oil, pay for the oil that they import from Russia? Actually, that gets us to this part where Russia is a major player in the global energy market. Now, when you place economic sanctions on a country as big as Russia, how does this play out for other countries? Well, let's take the key issue, really, for European Union. European Union imports a lot of coal from Russia, imports oil from Russia, but more importantly, it imports gas to the pipeline. Now, oil and coal can be replaced because it's really ships, tankers, which bring, bring this from other, other places. So there is a replacement that's theoretically possible. It may cause, cause a short-term dislocation, but officially, uh, uh, in practice, there are options available. The problem is going to be with gas because that's a limited market. The long-term contracts which are already reached for LNG, gas can either come through pipelines or it will come from LNG. Mm. So LNG tankers can bring you, bring you from West Asia, from other places, uh, gas. Liquefied natural gas, it has to be converted back to gas. Mm. The reconversion that has to take place needs an infrastructure which Germany still hasn't built. Okay. So European Union still does not have the regasification infrastructure, which will take at least six months to a year for them to build. Mm -hmm. So in, if they have to use gas, which they do, because they have a significant part of their energy consumption from gas, I think Germany uses 40% of its gas from Russia. Mm -hmm. So these are also true for other European Union countries, probably a little less than Germany, but a lot of them use 30%. Italy uses a significant amount and so on. So all of this means that they have to pay for their gas. Similarly, Russia exports oil, a particular what's called heavy crude. It exports to the um, United States. The only alternative to that for the refineries which handle that is Venezuela. In fact, the Russian supply increased because Venezuela was sanctioned. That's what the United States did, sanctioned Venezuela, and then it required heavy crude, which it could only get from Russia. Now, if they also sanction that, those refineries go out of action. So, U U.S. doesn't want that. So, they are doing mm. a carve out, both U.S. as well as the European Union, that not to sanction gas and oil, uh, particularly the heavy crude that it requires, the U.S. requires. And these are being kept out of sanction. The question is, how will they pay them? And will that also be frozen? That yes, you get the money, but we'll put it into your frozen accounts, or they will be able to uh, they will allow Russia to actually use the, that money, that money, or will that be, for instance, now designated in Reminbi? You pay through Reminbi, and that's not sanctioned, so I could use that. So all these are open questions, but it does seem that the, there are clear carve-outs for European Union and mm -hmm. United States for gas and oil that they require. So it seems to be also asymmetric. We'll cause as much pain as we can for you. But we don't want to take that pain ourselves, so we'll mm. let you supply us. Question is again, will Russia agree and say, okay, mm. now you've done this, <coughs> so 
so be it. We'll also cut off oil and uh, gas to you. So I think these are all open questions at the moment. So we don't know where this is going to go. But let's put it, we have put the, the world, the financial markets and the real markets in the world in an uncertain territory as of now. And we do not know how they will pan out because this is a huge step. Russia is not a small country, neither is it a small economy. Mm. So how this will play out is at the moment not clear. We are only talking about the possibilities. We'll keep observing this region, Prabir, with you. Thank you for those details. Stay with us for our next story as well. Now let's move on to our next story, which is on COVID-19 and the idea of the universal vaccine in general. The various vaccines produced under different platforms, the action of Big Pharma and the question of vaccine inequity have led many to wonder, why is it so difficult to have a universal vaccine? So Prabir, coming back to you, if you could explain us the idea behind this universal vaccine. Well, the idea behind the universal vaccine is that unlike the flu vaccine, which we change every year, or for instance, the pneumonia vaccine, which is against some 14 strains, strains of pneumonia, as an immunologist uh, explained to us today. So that those are the kind of vaccines we use. Mm. Can we change it to one vaccine against, say, all viruses uh, that we are all strains of viruses that we are likely to see, whether it be flu or whether it is, for instance, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 virus. Mm -hmm. So this is the this would be if we succeeded, then we would not have to hurry that uh, of uh, running to produce a vaccine when you see a new strain like Omicron emerge or Delta emerge and say, well, you know, this vaccine is not working. Like for instance, in the Omicron case, the vaccine wasn't working as effective, effectively to stop the infection. It worked to reduce deaths, serious illnesses, but it yes. did not uh, stop infections. Yeah. So the argument behind the universal vaccine is that there are certain parts of the vi virus that we target for vaccines. Mm -hmm. As you know, there is this famous uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, spike protein. Okay, yeah. which sort of attaches to our uh, nasal tract or the, the, mm -hmm. what, the airways uh, through which we breathe. And it gets into that. It attaches to our, uh, the, our skin over there. Again, there are certain portions which, attracts, mm -hmm. which at attaches to. And that, if we can find uh, a particular pattern uh, of antibody which will stop the spike protein all forms of spike all variants that we see of the spike protein mm -hmm. so that means that we try and see while the spike protein changes and that's why we get new variants. variants can we find a portion of the spike protein that is not changing and build our antibody uh, antibody or antibodies to target that, mm. which means that whatever variant now is produced, at least that we believe is structurally not going to change because in some way is essential for that spike protein to have that region constant. Mm. If such a region can be found and we can find antibodies which will prevent that from attaching to our cells, then we have got quote unquote the universal vaccine. Good question, how far are we from it? That is because, unfortunately, the, the different shapes the proteins take are very difficult to predict, and there are a huge number of possible shapes. Therefore, to find the perfect shape that will not change under such mutations, that, as of date, looks a difficult problem. And though there are a lot of people working on it, mm. at the moment, we don't seem to have a very clear idea that this is the way to go and maybe we can prevent we can prevent uh, that from you know a future variant emerging that we will have no answer to and we'll have to look for a next new vaccine again so this open question so as of now a lot of work research but as of now we don't really see a major breakthrough as yet so no real timeline on how feasible anytime soon it's going to be coming out it would be called the moonshot of vaccines, if you will. So yes, it's a moonshot. We invested it, but we don't know when. Thank you, Prabir, for those details.
And finally, we go to Brazil, where the famous carnival has been hit due to COVID-19 for a second straight year. The issue of the postponement has thrown into sharp focus the question of the country's handling of the COVID-19 crisis. Brazil's President Jair Bolsonaro's measures to combat the pandemic have been widely criticized, and it has led to a massive loss of popularity. My colleague Prashant spoke to Zoe Alexandra of People's Dispatch earlier on this issue. Let's listen in. Thank you so much, Zoe, for joining us. So a lot of confusion regarding the Carnival in Brazil, one of the major social events of the calendar, one of the key moments of celebration for the Brazilian people as a whole. And this has led to a lot of discussion on uh, the record of the Jair Bolsonaro government as well. So as I understand it, there's been some level of postponement. So could you just take us through what's happening? Yeah, so Carnival, for those of people who are not in the Catholic tradition world, Carnival is a tremendous celebration. Um, it marks the beginning of Lent, which is 40 days where you go without something. It's a, you know, also called Mardi Gras in New Orleans. Big celebration in Brazil. It's also a point of a lot of uh, incoming money from tourism. You know, thousands of people across the world come to Brazil to celebrate very important um, celebrations. And of course, last year, uh, Carnival was completely canceled and, and suspended. This was actually one of the first times in Brazilian history that the celebration of Carnival has been suspended, which I think tells you a lot about the importance of this holiday and also really the dramatic circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic. This year, people were hopeful that Carnival would be restored in its totality, but again, the Omicron variant continues to rage across the country. Of course, numbers are going down in significant uh, senses, but Brazil is one of the countries that has been most hard hit by the pandemic. There's over 650,000 deaths from COVID-19. Um, of course, we've been covering at People's Dispatch the disastrous management of the COVID-19 pandemic by the Jair Bolsonaro government. So because of this, Carnival is taking place to some degree this year, um, but in a much more limited capacity. Rio de Janeiro, which is one of the centers of the carnival celebration, has greatly limited the amount of celebrations which can happen. There are usually massive parades, big concerts that happen. All of these have been limited in terms of how many can take place, in terms of how many can part people can participate and attend. Um, and I think it's an important moment to kind of take stock of the deep impacts of the mismanagement of COVID-19 pandemic, but also really how this has had a continued, you know, triple fold effect on people's social lives, on people's political lives and their economic uh, situation. Right, Zoe, and of course, a lot of questions coming up since the, uh, Brazil is set to witness very, very vital elections later this year. So how is Jair Bolsonaro currently placed, especially if you consider his handling of the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, like other countries in the region um, that have had this very disastrous handling of the COVID-19 pandemic, Jair Bolsonaro has seen a massive hit to his popularity and his ratings. Um, in, the, in the polls, he's really, he's really not doing well. He still does have a very dedicated base that does support his policies, which have been characterized by racial hatred, by anti-science positions. Um, he's maintained that this base, but uh, there's large sections of the bourgeoisie in Brazil who are very fed up with his policies. As I mentioned, this is not only affecting the working class, but also large sections of the economy. Tourism has been really affected by the Brazil's handling of the pandemic. Business has not been able to return as usual. His initial approach of keep everything open had a horrible effect on the economy, horrible effect on workers, horrible effect on business owners as well. And so uh, Lula da Silva of the Workers' Party of Brazil is polling very strong um, in these upcoming elections. Of course, he is not the choice of the bourgeoisie in Brazil. Um, there are other candidates, um, Ciro Gomes and others, who are kind of vying for this maybe a middle upper class vote of people who don't really want a full kind of workers, <laughs> worker-centric policies, um, maybe pushing for more nationalization, um, but they are not going with Jair Bolsonaro. He has effectively been uh, kind of tossed out. People are not favoring him. Sergio Moro is another candidate. He was the judge who oversaw the Operation Car Wash proceedings against Lula da Silva. He's very supported by U.S. interests in Brazil. And so I think it's going to be a really interesting 
a contest between all of these forces that are kind of scrambling to distance themselves from Jair Bolsonaro, but also try to win the favor of these sectors of business in Brazil who have been deeply impacted by the pandemic and are looking for a return to stability. Right. Thank you so much. So we'll be covering the issue in Brazil in the coming weeks and months as well as it goes towards this vital election. Well, that's all that we have on Daily Debrief today. Do join us tomorrow and do keep following us on People's Dispatch. Thank you. Thank you.